This investigation is sponsored by Bright Sellers. We're back with another episode of Inner Earth Conspiracy Theories. In 1965, an elderly linguist living in the western United States reached out to the National Speleological Society with the intention to reveal a great secret he had long been harboring. Decades prior, during the Second World War in his home country of Czechoslovakia, he had accidentally stumbled upon a huge metallic structure with bizarre physical properties resembling what seemed to be advanced or even alien machinery deep within the recesses of a mountain cave. And seeing as how cave structures had literally formed around it, whatever it was had likely been there for a long, long time. This linguist was Dr. Antonin Harak, and he dubbed this mysterious and massive object the Moonshaft, because its entrance was perfectly circular, and inside was a deep shaft in the shape of a crescent moon. In his diaries, Harak himself speculated that it might have been an ancient technology from Atlantis, the long lost city spoken about in Greek legend. However, he also wondered what might lie beyond the moon shaft. The structure itself might be an ancient, heavily armored gateway to inner Earth. Moonshaft was called one of the biggest mysteries ever by the occultist and former French resistance spy Jacques Bergy, and he may have not been exaggerating. If it truly exists, this object is unlike any other ever found on Earth. And if it's some sort of technology, it might not be as dormant or abandoned as it appeared. Hey fellow seekers, welcome. I'm Mr. Mythos. If you're a fan of strange and ancient mysteries with research so deep you're guaranteed to fall down the rabbit hole, you're in the right place. I humbly ask that you give this video a like and ding the notification bell so you don't miss any of the rare info we'll be digging into every video. And if you love it, don't forget to share this series with a friend. But before we dive in, there's another mystery we need to solve, and it's a classic one. What's in this box? We've got wine. You know, with all the time I spend researching mysteries, sometimes I like to just take a moment and relax with a glass. Call it a form of self-care. That's why I love today's sponsor, Bright Sellers, who sent me these six bottles from around the world. When you're busy chasing rabbit holes, who has the time to shop for wine by the label? All it took was a quick seven question quiz to figure out my taste in wine and each one of these was picked for me. Bright Sellers even includes wine education cards to teach you about pairings, serving temperature, tasting notes, and origins. Like this one for Silverscape, a nicely aged Syrah with earthy elements and blackberry notes best served at 55 degrees Fahrenheit and paired with spiced lamb chops. They've also got a great blog called Glass Half Full to help a non-connoisseur like me learn about the wine world. Like, I had no idea that wine competitions not only judge based on flavor and aroma, but also the price to value ratio. Don't worry about value here though, Bright Sellers guarantees satisfaction and their concierge service is super helpful. Plus, once I rate my bottles, my next box will be even more geared to my taste. Speaking of boxes, Price Sellers has the industry's smallest carbon footprint with completely recyclable and plastic-free packaging. Sponsors like Price Sellers make it possible for me to do what I do, so be sure to take advantage of this offer. Click my link in the description for a limited time 50% off your first six bottle box. Thanks again to Price Sellers. Let's dive right into the inner earth puzzle that is the moonshaft of Slovakia. Antonin Harok's wartime diary and sketches are the primary source of information regarding the moonshaft. In 1965, in collaboration with the scholarly and highly respected National Speleological Society, Harok published his journal excerpts, including the specific geographic coordinates of the cave. All of this was contained in Volume 23, Part 3 of NSS News. It wasn't long until this publication caught the attention of Dr. J. Allen Hinek, the former scientific advisor of the U.S. Air Force's investigations into UFOs. Hinek wondered whether the moonshaft could have actually been a spaceship that crashed in ancient times. So he and his colleague, the fellow ufologist Ted Phillips, visited Dr. Hrock in 1970 interviewed him extensively, and made copies of the diagrams and illustrations he'd sketched some 26 years prior during the actual events. So 
In this video, the vast majority of the quotes and images we'll include are from these two primary sources. There was little reason to doubt Dr. Harak's account. Harak himself was a respected scholar in his community, a retired linguist who spoke seven languages fluently and a holder of four degrees in engineering. And according to research performed by Ted Phillips, before Harak's country had been torn apart by conflict, he'd come from a wealthy family in Bohemia who owned a number of timber forests and uranium mines. And in the early 20th century, they actually sold some of the first uranium samples to Marie Curie, the legendary physicist who would become the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for her research on radioactivity. Though he and his family were quite accomplished, Harak's life and career would take a rather dramatic turn when their country was invaded by the Germans in World War II. This story begins in 1944, specifically during a conflict known as the Slovak National Uprising, which was an armed insurrection against the German troops who'd occupied Slovak territory and effectively taken over the Slovak government. Among the rebels were a number of guerrilla troopers who hid out in the dense forest to sabotage and attack the enemy, and one of these troopers was Antonin Harok. Due to his significant leadership experience in his family business, Harok volunteered as captain of his own small military unit, which would operate across the Tatra mountain region. Unfortunately, that October, his unit would fall victim to a terrible German ambush. From here, the following details are taken directly from his diary. Quote, at dawn Sunday, the two 70mm guns opened up at us from close range, about 300 meters. Having held our position for 12 hours, I ordered a gradual breakup of the skirmish and slip off. But in our left trench, someone became careless, and that drew two direct hits. Shells, two wounded. Arriving there, I bumped into the enemy, caught a bayonet and bullet with my left palm and blow on my head, which put me out." End quote. Having suffered a strike to his skull with a heavy rifle stock, Harak lost consciousness until the next day, the 22nd of October, 1944. Meanwhile, the German invaders believed him to be dead and moved on. Waking up in a daze, the captain found himself still lying in the same trench. A local herdsman, who Harak described as a tall peasant, spotted him from across the field and ran over. Shocked that someone had actually survived the battle, he offered to treat Harak's injured hand. The herdsman helped the captain to his feet and together they wandered around the trenches, managing to find two more wounded members of his unit, the soldiers Urek and Martin. These two were clearly in bad shape, so immediately the herdsman got to treating them the best he could. Quote, this rough and ready Samaritan grabbed Urek, stripped off his pants, yanked the long sliver of steel from his thigh, and planted him bare-bottomed and gasping into a heap of snow. Martin, with a slash across and into his belly, was tenderly bandaged. Building a stretcher, the peasant introduced himself as Slovak a sheepman, owner of the pastures hereabouts." End quote. Both Urek and Martin were suffering greatly, but Martin in particular was in a grave state. He couldn't move at all, so the three able men constructed a makeshift stretcher, lifted him on, and began a grueling trek to a location Slovak believed they would be safe, a remote cave hidden away in the nearby mountains. In his diary, Harak never specifies the name of this mountainous region, but the editor of the NSS publication provides the geographic coordinates, 49 degrees 18 minutes north and 20 degrees 42 minutes east, which seems to place the cave in the Tatra Mountains. However, this was the editor's note, so some speculate that these coordinates may have not come directly from Harak, but simply given by the publisher to help readers locate the general area. On top of this, modern day explorers have visited these coordinates and confirmed that there's no cave in that specific location. But if Harak was the one who provided them, it was probably just his best guess given the circumstances. Harak passed away in 1976, so we may never know. Though the cave wasn't too far up the snowy mountain, 
it was undoubtedly challenging for three injured men, two of whom were carrying the other on a stretcher. But after this strenuous hike, they could finally see the dark entrance ahead. Without hesitation, Harak and Yurek entered and gently placed Martin down in the corner, after which the two collapsed to the ground, staring in astonishment and confusion as the herdsman Slovak began to enact a strange ceremony. The herdsman gave the sign of the cross on himself and on each of the soldiers, then to the cave itself, ending with a deep bow to the cave's back wall, which contained a large open crack that caught the curious eye of Harak. Finishing his ritual, Slovak then turned to Harak and told him what he knew of this place. Quote, that only once, with his father and grandfather, had he been in this cave. That it is a huge maze, full of pits which they never wanted to fathom. Pockets of poisonous air, and certainly haunted. End quote. Now, Slovakia is a country replete with countless Gothic churches, looming castles, towering mountains, and thick forests that seem likely a home for fairies, if such creatures truly exist. Many of its most famous locations are drenched in Slovak folklore, and that of course includes ghosts. But it was still odd that Slovak would call this cave haunted after only one visit. Unless, of course, that descriptor came from his elders. The cave had been known to Slovak's family for generations, so that begs a question. What could have prompted the idea that the cave was inhabited by spirits? Once Slovak had finished his ritual, he instructed the three injured soldiers to wait inside the cave, as he planned to head back to town and come back later in the afternoon with supplies. According to Harak's diary, he again performed the ritual, then left. A few hours passed, and Slovak returned with his daughter Honka, both carrying medicine, a small amount of food, and a tiny bottle of Slivovitz, a rather spicy type of fruit brandy popular in that region. However, it wasn't much. None of the soldiers had eaten since Friday, almost three days prior, and even then, the entire week they had rationed only a few morsels of bread. The herdsman assured them that he'd bring them more food the next day, and he and his daughter left as the sun was beginning to set. Not long after, though, the weather took a dramatic turn for the worse. Quote, With this deluge of snow, avalanches imminent, and enemy skiers roaming, Slovak may not be able to get through to us with food for days to come. End quote. They were hungry now, but soon they'd be starving. After a long cold night, they awoke in the morning of October 23rd. In his diary, Harak writes with a bit of dry humor, quote, Miserable night. Martin at time conscious. I gave him three aspirins and hot water to sip with drops of Slivovitz. Yurek cobbled hungrily around the two German helmets in which he boiled water, to which I added ten drops of Slivovitz, our breakfast. End quote. Obviously, that wasn't much to fill their stomachs, and the weather showed no signs of improvement it became apparent that they would need to find a source of food on their own. Certainly, Harak was in a better condition than his two comrades, and his curiosity for what lay behind the crack in the cave's back wall had only grown since the previous day. Given the circumstances, he contemplated whether he should break his promise to Slovak and venture deeper. Quote, Here we have this cave which Slovak knows only partially. It may have more than this known entrance, and it may contain hibernating animals. These possibilities I mulled over while Yurek was chewing pine bark, and as expected, he implored me to go poaching into Slovak's cave and promised to keep mum. And I was not only starved, but equally eager to find out what makes self-assured Slovak scared enough to invoke the deities." End quote. The crack in the back wall was large enough for a grown adult to just barely squeeze their way in, so Harak equipped himself with several torches made from pine wood, a field pickaxe, and his rifle, and entered into the pitch black recesses. From here, torch in hand, he traveled deeper along the passage for approximately 90 minutes without much challenge, until he finally reached a small vent. The captain got down on his knees and crawled in, and what he saw inside was 
unlike anything else he has seen in his life. Quote, Still kneeling, I froze in amazement. There stands something like a large black silo, framed in white. Regaining breath, I thought that this is a bizarre natural wall or curtain of black salt, or ice or lava. But I became perplexed, then awestruck, when I saw that it is a glass-smooth flank of seemingly man-made structure, which reaches into the rocks on all sides. Beautifully cylindrically curved, it indicates a huge body with a diameter of about 25 meters. Where this structure and the rocks meet, large stalagmites and stalactites form that glittering white frame. The wall is uniformly blue-blackish. Its material seems to combine properties of steel, flint, rubber. The pick made no marks and bounced off vigorously. Even the thought of a tower-sized artifact embedded in rock in the middle of an obscure mountain, in a wild region where not even legend knows about ruins, mining, industry, overgrown with age-old cave deposits, is bewildering. The fact is appalling." End quote. So, this odd structure that Antony and Herak encountered might be a little hard to visualize, but basically it was a massive, dark, cylindrical object which along its edges had been encrusted by natural geologic cave formation, indicating that whatever it was, it had to be hundreds of thousands of years old, easily predating the oldest known human civilizations. However, because it was so perfectly smooth and shaped, to Herak it appeared to be artificial. But whatever material it was made out of was so incredibly hard that, despite a grown man directly hitting it with a pickaxe, the pickaxe bounced off of it like rubber and left not a dent or scratch. After this, Herak carefully inspected it, and despite the structure's hardness, he noticed that right through the middle there was a somewhat wide vertical crack. Quote, not immediately discernible, a crack in the wall appears from below, about 20 to 25 centimeters wide, tapers off and disappears into the cave's ceiling, 2 to 5 centimeters wide. Its insides, right and left, are pitch black and have fist-sized, sharp valleys and crusts. The crack's bottom is a rather smooth trough of yellow limestone and drops very steeply, about 60 degrees, into the wall. I threw a lighted torch through. It fell and extinguished with loud cracklings and hissings. Driven to explore and believing me thin enough to get through this upside-down keyhole, I went in. Wriggling sideways, injured hand and head below and steeply downward, nearly standing on my head, cramped though my right arm with the lamp could move in the extended crack above me. The crush got the better of me and I had to get out, back, quickly. And that became a struggle." End quote. After a momentary panic, Herak was finally able to dislodge himself and, considering how much time had passed, it was time to return to camp. He returned around 4pm and decided not to inform his comrades of what he'd seen, simply explaining to Yurek that the hunt required smoke, poles, and rope. That evening, by some miracle, the weather had cleared and the three soldiers were visited by Slavek and Hanka who brought significant food rations this time around. Martin was still conscious. However, his condition had visibly grown more dire. Harak woke the next morning, October 24th, his head still swollen from being bashed by the German rifle. However, his curiosity for what he discovered the day before dulled any pain he felt. He needed rope, so the captain cut and braided their uniform belts to a length of 8 meters. Then he headed into the crack in the back wall, then 90 minutes onward to the structure, determined to try again to climb into the small opening. Quote, I anchored the rope over a stick across the crack and, keeping it slung over my shoulder, forced myself again into the grim maw. Like yesterday, the lamp was on a stick ahead within the jaw above. When it came through and down, it swung freely over some void into which I could not see, and there was again rushing, as if from agitated waters." End quote. 
Harak found this quite frightening, hearing what he thought to be water at the bottom of a chamber so large that the light of his lamp couldn't reveal even a single feature. But as he tried to wriggle back out, his clothing became caught by some jagged edges and essentially plugged him within the crack, which terrified him even more than the last time. After an intense struggle that he likened to being burned alive, Harak managed to escape, exhausted and hallucinating from the adrenaline. After taking a moment to compose himself, Harak couldn't help but wonder if it really was water he heard at the bottom of the chamber. So he decided to experiment. Quote, I hacked stalagmites into short rolls and bowled them through the crack. They rolled on, causing enormous echoes and knocked to a standstill, indicating a solid floor and room to turn. I launched the unlit torches after the stones, undressed, keeping the shirt only, and went after the stones and torches. Already acquainted with the meanest fangs in the crack, I came through with only a few cuts, dropped a little, rolled down an incline, and was stopped by a wall which felt familiar, satiny smooth like the front wall." End quote. Here, Harak had completely entered the moonshaft for the first time, and it's safe to say that the inside was just as puzzling as the outside. All walls seemed to be forged of the same incredibly hard, dark material, leaving Harak with the impression that the cylindrical entrance and this inner chamber were part of one unique, singular structure. However, the bizarre properties of this material became far more apparent with what he could hear rather than the little he could see. Clearly, there was no water at the bottom, despite the continuous echoing and rumbling. And beyond that, all other noises seemed to be amplified as well. Quote, Here were confusing sounds. Lighting my torches, I saw that I was in a spacious, curved black shaft formed by cliff-like walls which intersect and form a crescent-shaped, nearly vertical tunnel, rather shaft. I cannot describe the somberness and the endless whisperings, rustlings, and roaring sounds, abnormal echoes from my breathing and movements. All the lights together did not reach the ceiling or where these walls end or meet. To explore further, I needed more light and my pick, which does not fit through the crack and must be taken apart." End quote. At this point, it was time to return to the camp, so Harak crawled back through the hole which was thankfully easier to exit than to enter. Upon his return, he informed his comrades that he was unsuccessful at hunting any bats, and showed them the scratches on his back and shirt as proof that he tried. Again, he opted not to tell them of the moonshaft. Quote, I am glad that Yurek's thigh is not yet well enough for him to want to go with me poaching for bats. It is better that he knows nothing about the cave's secret. End quote. After a restful night's sleep, Harak awoke on October 25th with an intense feeling that he had to return to the moonshaft. So, as soon as he could, he headed directly to the structure, then in front of the small cracked entrance, he removed his clothes and smeared his body with mutton fat, which allowed him to easily slide into the inner chamber, along with his disassembled pickaxe and rifle. Curious how high these ceilings reached, as the light of his torch failed to reveal it, Harak aimed his rifle directly upward. Quote, I fired two bullets up, parallel to the walls. The report caused roars, as from an express train, but no impact was visible. Then I fired one bullet on each wall, aiming some 15 meters upward from me, got large blue-green sparks and such sounds that I had to hold my ears between my knees and flames danced wildly." End quote. And next, he assembled his pickaxe and came across what seemed to be a patch of limestone at the right horn of the crescent moon-shaped chamber. He began digging into it with his pickaxe, and here he made two very strange discoveries. Quote, At about half a meter, I came upon a pocket of animal from the teeth of some large animal. I took one canine and one molar and replaced the rest. End quote. Coming across these skeletal remains of a large animal was absolutely bizarre, 
because obviously there would be no way for such an animal to fit in through the same crack Hurok had come through. If we can temporarily jump to the end of the diary, several months after the events, Hurok reveals that he had the canine and molar professionally examined. Quote, I have taken the animal teeth I had collected to the curator of paleontology at Ujhorod, and he classified them as an adult cave bear, Ursus Spalius. End quote. What may have not been known back in Hurok's time, though, is that this particular cave bear species, Ursus Spalius, had gone extinct some 25,000 years ago. This not only indicates that the moonshaft is at least that old, but there are only two possibilities for how the cave bear got there in the first place. Either the chamber's main door, the circular exterior, was once open, or there was another entrance which had now been closed, which might imply that the structure was mechanical, with moving parts. His second discovery was arguably just as perplexing. Built into the wall of the chamber's left horn was a set of wavy grooves emitting heat. Quote, the back wall has a vertical, finely fluted, undulating pattern. It seemed warmer than the smooth surface. I tried with lip and ear and believe the impression is correct. End quote. Keep in mind that within the moonshaft itself is a constant rustling and roaring. And then we've got what seems to be the grill of a radiator, dispersing heat, not so unlike that of a modern machine. It almost sounds like we're describing an engine. Let me know in the comments what you think. This whole thing is honestly super bizarre. So, having investigated the chamber for a long while, Harak burned through all of his available torches and was forced to return to camp. Along the way, though, he successfully caught a few bats for dinner, which Yurak happily stuffed with bread and herbs for cooking. Later in the evening, the herdsman Slavek and another of his daughters named Olga arrived with hay for bedding, sheep's fleece for blankets, and a handful of medicinal herbs. Harak describes it as a good night. The following day, October 26, 1944, Harak would return to the moonshaft to continue his experiments. This time, he assembled an even longer pole to stretch his lamp to the ceiling, however, he still couldn't see it. He then fired several more bullets, resulting in only sparks, echoes, and a continued lack of answers. One bullet, though, managed to create a reaction with the hard black material of the wall. Quote, no splinters, but a half-finger-long welt which gave a pungent smell." End quote. After this, Hurok continued digging at the heat-emitting grill in the left horn of the crescent moon, noting that on the right horn, the location of the cave bear remains, there was no such pattern or anomaly. Finally, he again fired several more bullets at the walls. Quote, I wish to obtain a sample of a peculiar material of the walls. But even firing two bullets into the crack, upon the protrusions and hitting them, I received only ricochets, a blast of thunder, welts, and the same pungent smell." End quote. That night, the soldiers again enjoyed stuffed bats for dinner. Slavek and his daughter visited with more supplies, a quarter of a deer, half a kilogram of salt, and a tin of carbide. Horrock slept early. Yurak took both night watches, and Martin, who'd been immobilized due to his deep stomach lesion, died in his sleep. It was now the gray-skied, chilly morning of October 27th. Quote, Martin slept into death. Yurak knows his kin, took charge of his belongings, including his wallet with 643 crowns, watch with chain, and my signed death certificate. Now we are free and ready to leave and rejoin our battalion. We will start tomorrow." End quote. With Martin's passing, the soldiers had no further reason to stay in the cave, so Hrok set off to finalize his secret investigation of the moonshaft before they left. Quote, At 10 a.m., I was in the cave probing passages for a way behind the moonshaft. Looked also for ice and poisonous air, about which Slavek had spoken and found none. 
though there may be some. Then I slipped into the moon shaft to sketch, dig, and ponder, and returned to camp at about 4 p.m. End quote. Later that evening, as if the family had sensed the death of Martin, Slovak and his two daughters all arrived, and together they wrapped the soldier's body in a blanket and carried him to the same trench where the enemy had dealt his mortal wound, and took turns digging his grave, praying and burying him. Horak paid Slovak 150 crowns to raise a wooden cross on Martin's grave the following spring, and Slovak briefed Horak on the movement of the enemy, to assure the safety of their travels. It was a restful night, and Horak awoke early on October 28th. As Yurek was fast asleep following his night watch duty, the captain took this opportunity to leave something behind in this moonshaft that has so captivated his mind. Quote, I cut my name on a leather strip, and together with the golden back of my watch, rolled and inserted both engravings into a glass bottle plugged it with a pebble and a ball of clay mixed with charcoal, and deposited this record into the moon shaft, on top of the ashes of my torches. It may stay there for a long time, possibly until the structure is completely hidden behind his curtain of stalactites and stalagmites. Slovak has no son to tell him about his cave mystery. His womenfolk don't know about it, and anyway, daughters usually marry to other villages. In a few decades, nobody will know." End quote. After leaving his mark for someone or no one to find, Hrok constructed a makeshift fire to rest by, enjoying the last of his time within the moon shaft. In the endlessly rumbling ambience, he soon became overwhelmed with a sense of melancholic wonder about what he had witnessed and experienced. Quote, I sat there by my fire speculating, what is this structure, with walls two meters thick and a shape I cannot imagine of any purpose known nowadays? How far does it reach into the rocks? Is there more behind the moon shaft? Which incident or who put it into this mountain? Is it a fossilized man-made object? Is there truth in legends like Plato's about long-lost civilizations with magic technologies which our rationale cannot grasp? nor believe. I am a sober, academically trained person, but must admit that here, between these black, satiny, mathematically curved cliffs, I do feel as if in the grip of an exceedingly strange and grim power." End quote. With that said, Harak began his final trek back to the camp, and during this journey, he was burdened with two particular concerns. The first, for what he should do with this newfound knowledge, and the second, for the structure's preservation against more problematic visitors. Quote, I can understand that simple but intelligent and practical men like Slavek and his forebearers sense here witchery and conceal it. Ever made known, it would attract armies of tourists and commercialization which would probably ruin their nature-bound trade and honest life. If and when I come back, it will be with a team of secrecy-bound experts, geologists, metallurgists, and cave experts. And if the object is of true importance for the advancement of knowledge and proper civilization, it will to have to be found to respect the Slovak's interests. On my way back to camp, I burrowed and hid the crawl holes which lead toward the wall. The cave may have entrances which Slovak does not know, and some chance discoverer may start blasting for treasure before a scientific team can get there." End quote. The story of Moonshaft, however, isn't without its own unexpectedly heartwarming ending. When Slovak and his two daughters arrived in the evening, carrying hard-boiled eggs for the two surviving men, Yurek had his own secret plan in mind. Quote, Yurek asked permission to talk privately with Slovak, and then Hanka was carefully sounded out by her father whether she would accept Yurek as her husband. She cried and laughed. Yurek gave her his photograph and golden watch which his father had brought from America. Yurek is a well-to-do carpenter in Bratislava. I am invited to the wedding and will try to come." End quote. As the two soldiers left the cave in the moonlight's glow, 
descended down the mountain and entered into the lush pinewood forest. They turned and saw Slavek and his two daughters, sweeping their footprints and carefully concealing the cave entrance. Two days later, Harak and Yurek would cross paths with a partisan group of Jewish fighters who they accompanied on their way to rejoin their main battalion, after which the included diary excerpts end, October 28th, 1944. Concluding the 1965 NSS publication, however, Harak recalls one final visit to the moonshaft. Quote, In the very last days of World War II, on my way towards Bohemia, I've revisited the place. The Slaveks lived temporarily at Zadar. I visited Martin's grave and looked at the cave entrance. On my last visit to the place, I examined the mountainside above the cave and found no sinkholes or pits, the assumed connections toward the moonshaft. But on these very steep slopes in the Tatra Mountains, rock slides could have obliterated or filled in any such connections. In correspondence dealing with plans for the publications of this journal, Dr. George W. Moore suggested that the moonshaft might have been dissolved from a steeply dipping limestone layer between curved parallel walls of chert. I am skeptical. All the inner surfaces of the moonshaft are composed of the same material. Also, such a hypothesis does not explain the peculiar, exactly parallel, finely grooved pattern on the back surface or wall of the left horn." End quote. Not long after his final visit and the end of World War II, the Soviet Union assumed control of the region's government and the Russians forced Antonin Horok to direct several mining operations against his will. This didn't last long though, as just a few months later, Horok and his wife Anna fled to France. And in 1952, they immigrated to the United States, first living in Lincoln, Nebraska, where Antonin legally changed his name to Tony. And a few years later, they moved to Pueblo, Colorado, where Dr. Tony Harak established his career as a linguist. The burden of knowledge, of course, never ceased. In 1965, Harak made the difficult decision to go public with his moonshaft discovery in collaboration with the National Speleological Society, and in 1970, he provided further information to the ufologists Dr. J. Allen Hinek and Ted Phillips, which we'll be getting into soon. Finally, on February 15, 1976, Tony Hurok passed away at the age of 78, leaving more questions than answers. It's unfortunate that during its existence, Czechoslovakia had long been a country with strained politics, and particularly after the Prague Spring of 1968, it was a very difficult place to visit, let alone organize a scientific research expedition to locate and investigate the moonshaft structure. Notably, American scientists weren't allowed into the country, and they were the ones most aware of what Hurok had found. It was only in 1980, Four years after Hrok's death that the first field expedition was carried out by the Czech explorers Ivan McCurl and Mihail Brumlik, which was then followed up by a larger investigation performed by the Museum of Slovak Karst. However, neither group was able to locate the Moonshaft Cave, nor any reliable information about the herdsman Slovak and his two daughters. Another major inconsistency became apparent as well. The diary mentions that the cave was located near the villages of Izdar, Lubochna, and Plavno, but these are not real places in Slovakia, at least not by those exact names. From those who've researched the moonshaft mystery extensively, however, there is an answer worth considering, and it's hinted at near the end of the diary entries, where Harak himself emphasizes that he'd go out of his way to ensure a layer of secrecy to protect both the moonshaft artifact and the livelihoods of the village people. Seeing as how he chose to go public with what he found, it would seem almost hypocritical if he didn't take some measures to conceal the exact location from treasure hunters and enterprising capitalists. At this point, we can be pretty sure that the coordinates provided were meant to generally point to the Tatra Mountains, not actually a specific location, and the village's Izdar Lubochna and Plavno may not exist, 
what? These names do sound an awful lot like the real villages, GDR, Luboknia, and Plavetch. Uh, these details could have very well been altered to intentionally confuse those with unsavory intentions. We can argue this pretty strongly, in fact, because there is some evidence that Horok's story actually happened, despite certain details being fabricated. This first came to light in 1994 in a special Czech television broadcast where the TV station Četejedna collaborated with a research group led by the treasure hunter Walter Pavlich. And incredibly, I was able to dig up a copy of this obscure broadcast, so you can see these discoveries for yourself. So, in this broadcast, the editors of the show, alongside Pavlich and a team of speleologists, visited an unnamed Slovak cave, with its location obscured and revealed an inscription in the cave wall. The letters H-A, which could stand for Horok Antonin. Six cross lines, which could indicate the six days spent in the cave, and the numbers 23 and possibly 44. Note that Horok's diary begins on October 23rd, 1944. While this seems like an obvious match, there was a serious problem. The rear wall of the cave had no large crack as described by Horak. So while that might seem like a literal dead end, there is one person believed to have visited the actual Moonshaft cave, and that was the ufologist Ted Phillips, who dedicated much of his research career to working with the late Dr. Horak and then carrying on the Moonshaft legacy after the Slovakian's death. In 1970, Ted Phillips and Dr. J. Allen Hinek visited Horak at his home in Pueblo, Colorado. At the time, Phillips was a prominent UFO researcher and the director of the Center for Physical Trace Research, as well as a close research associate of Dr. Hinek. Hinek himself, though, was a far more well-known figure, thanks to his prior prolific career as a scientific advisor for Project Blue Book and several other UFO investigation endeavors conducted by the U.S. Air Force. Notably, Hinek was a former UFO skeptic turned believer, and he had a hunch that Horak's description of the moonshaft may have actually been that of a misidentified extraterrestrial spacecraft that perhaps crashed there in ancient times. With this in mind, Hinek organized a meeting with Horak and invited Phillips to lead the investigation. During this meeting, the two would collect a number of sketches and diagrams made by Horak during the events, photos he'd taken during another visit to the cave, information on his family background, and additional details not included in the diary. From here, Ted Phillips would set out to locate the moonshaft himself and conduct a proper investigation of the structure initiating what he called Project Tatra, and later Project Moonshaft. He expected to embark on an expedition to Czechoslovakia soon after, but his plans came to a halt when he realized there was no way he could enter the country as a US citizen, given the tumultuous political situation that has sparked just a few years prior. It wasn't until nearly 30 years later, in 1999, that Phillips would finally raise enough funding and make his trek to Slovakia. There, he traveled to the location which Horak had specified for him, discovered a cave, and entered. Just as Horak had described, there was a large crack in the rear wall, presenting an opening to a larger cave system. However, Phillips would admit that he couldn't make it very far in, as the interior cave had partially collapsed. And with this, he was unfortunately never able to reach the moonshaft. In a presentation for the Mutual UFO Network conference, he described his decades-long investigation into the moonshaft as, quote, the single most important thing I have ever been involved in, end quote. Unfortunately, Ted Phillips passed away in March of 2020, and with him, the true location of moonshaft may be lost to time. However, it's worth noting that in his investigation, Phillips came across an unexpected connection. While exchanging letters with two Russian scientists, they revealed to him several ancient manuscripts that were found in Siberia, 
describing an event where what seemed to be a large black cylindrical object with curved walls appeared in the sky one day and landed. The structure made horrible noises and due to this the local villagers avoided approaching it. Regardless, those who recorded this event stated that it was so tall that they could clearly see it from a very far away distance. However, each day the dark cylindrical object seemed to grow shorter and shorter until it eventually disappeared. And with it, so did the terrible noise. The villagers finally made their way to the area, and where the object once stood was now a massive chasm in the shape of a crescent moon so deep that its bottom could not be seen. This story is a bit haunting, the idea of an extraterrestrial drill-like machine burrowing into the earth for some unknown purpose. What if the moonshaft was one of these machines? Also, the, the moonshaft was hollow, so it would have likely been carrying something. So what would be the reason for bringing whatever it was down into inner earth? If you've spent some time in the UFO community, you might know that stories of dark, cigar-shaped UFOs entering and exiting caves is a reoccurring trope. They might seem to originate from the sky, outer space, but why not the opposite? What if the moonshaft wasn't technically an extraterrestrial spacecraft, as Ted Phillips and Dr. Hinek theorized? Extraterrestrial might not be the term we're looking for here. After all, the moonshaft was located in a mountainous cave system, which may have extended deep underground. So let's propose an alternative theory, that of an intraterrestrial origin. If you've watched other episodes of my Inner Earth Conspiracy series, you're already well aware that legends of ancient, technologically advanced, godlike people living in hidden underground civilizations are pretty much found in every continent of the world and in every major culture's folklore. So I won't beat around the bush with these god people, but instead, let's explore another well-known mythology that might very well be related. The legend of the fire-breathing dragon that lives in a mountain cave is one of the most ancient and foundational stories of Central European folklore, and that includes the region of modern-day Slovakia. Countless ancient legends there tell of dragons that fly out of deep and remote caverns in the mountains, spewing out flames as they soar above and later returning to rest in the same inner earth lair. Obviously, there are some connections to be made with the UFO phenomenon. In fact, one of the earliest UFO sightings in recorded history actually comes from Slovakia, which back then was part of the Hungarian kingdom. In 1662, in an article published in the Lvovich Chronicle, the chronicler Gaspar Hein recorded an incident where the Slovak town of Lvovich experienced a strong earthquake, after which something that resembled a huge silver lizard was witnessed flying across the sky, creating a dense black cloud behind it and burning the tops of all the forest trees in its path. Even stranger, according to another record in the Chronicle, the author Hein claimed to have actually discovered the dragon's lair in the region today known as Strba. Beyond this account, there is also an old Jewish legend from the Slovak region of a king of demons with azure wings, who is described as bigger than the tallest tree and who soars to the heavens during the day to enjoy the beauties of distant worlds. But that's not all. The legend tells that in the evening, the demon king returns back to his lair deep within the caves of a mountain far from Jerusalem, to refresh himself with water from within a deep metal well. A deep metal well sounds an awful lot like the moon shaft. We might go out on a limb and say that the flying silver lizard of Lavocha and the Jewish king of demons may have been a misinterpretation of an ancient intraterrestrial technology, and clearly a powerful one. What its purpose was obviously remains unknown, but with any great power comes those who seek it, and these ancient myths may have had more impact on history than we might assume at first glance. So here's a bit of a conspiracy theory for you. Maybe a bit controversial, but this is inner earth conspiracy, so we're going to dive down the rabbit hole or the moon shaft one last time. 
Some people have speculated that the same event that spurred the resistance movement that Antonin Harak was a part of, the German invasion of Czechoslovakia, was in part fueled by a mission to find and harness this inner earth technology spoken of in old stories such as the ones in Slovakia and Siberia. March 14, 1939 was the date that the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia and seized the capital city of Prague. What's important to note here is that the ones who carried out the most vital steps in this seizure were a specialized group of SS soldiers, personally supervised by Heinrich Himmler, the director of the SS. Today, Himmler is rather infamous for having held a strong belief in hollow earth theory and the magical technology rumored to be possessed by inner earth or intraterrestrial beings. According to Gunter Rosenberg, a scholar of the European Occult Research Society, quote, Himmler's SS organization had collected folktales from throughout Europe of weird caves, tunnels, and haunted mines. One of their most promising areas was several regions in Czechoslovakia with ancient legends about prehistoric civilizations and superior beings who lived beneath the earth, end quote. If this conspiracy theory is even partially true, it's ironic that Himmler's goal is what led to an enemy captain discovering the very inner earth technology he'd been searching for. One has to wonder whether all of these stories might have some grain of truth, whether the myths of ancient times were more accurate than we give them credit for, and whether Antonin Horrock's account of the moonshaft could be a legitimate description of an ancient extraterrestrial or intraterrestrial technology. For at least 40 years to this day, geologists, ufologists, and professional cavers continue to search the Tatras mountain range of Slovakia, but the moonshaft remains to be found. However, we should never cease to dive deeper. After all, the world has its secrets, and the greatest of all might be buried underground. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, and if you love the ideas and conspiracy theories of Inner Earth, I've got a whole playlist of Inner Earth videos for you to enjoy, and also another playlist of related side stories that build on the lore. Both are linked in the description below. If you're a patron of the channel, I want to thank you for your support and let you know that your contributions go directly to the making of these videos, and that means helping me access research papers and books purchase scans of rare archive documents and photographs of artifacts, and in the future, hopefully fund actual trips to these locations. If you'd like to join in as a patron of the channel, I've got links in the description where you can pledge monthly or make a one-time donation. Thank you all again. I'm Mr. Mythos. You guys are awesome. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.